Hey everyone, it's Hamish from the Young Investors Podcast. Myself and Brandon are excited to bring you your weekly rundown of the latest business and investing news from around the world. A quick reminder before we get started, any advice provided by Brandon is general and does not consider your financial situation, needs or objectives, so consider whether it's appropriate for you. Brandon van der Kolk is authorized to provide general financial product advice in Australia and is authorized representative number 1305795 of Guideway Financial Services Proprietary Limited, AFSL number 420367. Please see the description box for Brandon's financial services guide. Past performance is not a reliable indication of future investment returns. But with that said, let's get into another episode of the Young Investors Podcast. Okay, everyone, welcome back to the Young Investors Podcast. Hamish Hodder is hello, joining hello. me as always. Hamish, how are you going, my friend? Yeah, I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing good. It's uh, it's it's. We've had beautiful weather here in uh, in Melbourne recently. I'm very thankful of that. My mood is mood is up because the weather is up and uh, and uh, the sun is shining. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's been right. very rainy lately, but now the sun is shining and we are good to go. And yep. in this episode, we are going to be talking about what investors need to know for 2020. 24. So we've put our brain yep. together, put our two brain cells together, as <laughs> Hamish likes we've, to say. We've put our brain together, our one brain. <laughs> our one brain we put out. <laughs> two, two uh, halves. All right. Yep. Welcome back, everybody, to the Young Investors Podcast. <laughs> so we've put our two brain cells together. We've thought, have had a bit of a thunk. We've had a thunk about what investors need to know for 2024. <laughs> so with that said, we've got part one, which is the backdrop. Yep. And we've got part two, which is what to expect this year. And then we've got part three, which is what, how to invest or what investors actually need to do during this time. So with that said, yep. I was going to give us a bit of a backdrop first. Yep. Um, and the backdrop is around where, where we are right now in terms of the macroeconomic environment, um, specifically to do with inflation and uh, interest rate hikes. So yeah, I- we'll start with how this all started, I guess. Yeah. Um, and it started, obviously, as a, result, uh, as a result of the coronavirus. So over the past few years, uh, we've seen both supply constraints as a lot of places were shut down. We've also seen the demand for goods and services rise because the US government did widespread stimulus in the form of cash payments to citizens and also various relief measures for businesses. Yep. So when you think about that, just at a, at a straight up supply demand, like let's bring it back to its most basic pieces, the supply demand equation. If you have a situation where you choke supply and you also increase demand or you have both running at the same time, that is going to cause prices to rise. Yep. Um, now, I'm using the US in this example, but this basically happened everywhere around the world. Yep. Um, so in the US, inflation went from basically zero in 2020 and um, as time went on, it rose and rose and rose and rose, and it hit a peak of 9.1% in June of 2022. Yeah, yeah. And I, so I think... Um, quite high. Yeah, like the specific numbers who, who knew, nobody really knew what was going to happen, but I think the idea that we were going to see some kind of inflationary environment was probably one of the easiest economic calls in, in the scheme of the, the idea, you know, e- economic calls are difficult to make and most people can never make them. It's mostly extremely unpredictable, but that was kind of one thing in, in recent history where uh, the environment kind of made it very obvious, at least to some people, I think that, uh, that we were going to see at least some inflationary effects out, out of COVID just because of how it was yeah. handled. Um, yeah, it's just a result of how it was handled. You're exactly right. Um, the problem is, is that when inflation starts rolling, it tends to keep going. And that's why you see places you know, where it doesn't get handled correctly, like Zimbabwe, for example, get inflation just run crazy. It goes into hyperinflation. And then in a couple of years' time, the entire currency of the nation is completely worthless. Yeah. Like you wouldn't even wipe your butt with you know, the Zimbabwean <laughs> dollar because it's just worth absolutely nothing. Yeah. Um, that's kind of uh, like in Germany. I can't remember what was their, what was their currency called? Oh, the I Reich, don't know. Reichmark? They yeah. ended up, it was worth so little that they would put it in the... Um, in the fireplace just to burn, to try and generate heat. Yeah. Um, so anyway, 
So when inflation starts rolling, it tends to keep going. So the central bank will usually step in and raise interest rates, which essentially puts the brakes on the economy. So raising interest rates, you can think about what it does. It makes mortgages more expensive. It makes business loans more expensive. And generally speaking, everybody has less free cash because their debts just got harder to service. So this overall reduces just willy-nilly spending and, um, and overall that tends to lower inflation. Yeah. Now, and in the US, sorry, yeah. Sorry, all I was going to add as well, it it also makes a uh, it, it makes a lot of business investment cases make a lot less sense because, you know, a business is looking at their cost of capital and how much it's going to cost them to get the money to then invest in these in make these investments. So if interest rates go up these all of a sudden growth initiatives. Yeah, all of a sudden previously it's like, oh, we get a 3% loan and we'll make 5%, but now if it's a 6% loan and it's still a 5% return, that money just doesn't get invested. So you just kind of get a general mm. economic uh, slowdown in you know economic growth, you know, in that respect as well. Businesses opening less stores, you know, expanding internationally less often. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's just kind of one thing on top of, you know, the, the things you mentioned. Yeah. So uh, in the US, the Federal Reserve, initially they lowered interest rates uh, during COVID. And that was just at the onset of the pandemic, basically just to help everybody out because <laughs> everyone, we're all a bit nervous. It was a tough time. Immediately it was a tough time. So they lowered it to zero just to help everybody out. But then inflation soared. And once that happened, uh, they raised interest rates on 11 occasions, bringing the Federal Reserve funds rate from zero to between, well, what we see exactly right now, which is between 5.25 and 5.5%. Now, in doing this, the Federal Reserve has successfully reversed the inflation trend. So as I said, inflation was at 9.1%. Today, it sits at 3.4%, which is still higher than the Fed's target of 2%. But the trend has definitely been in the right direction with inflation, thanks to these increases in interest rates. Yeah. Um, furthermore, uh, so unfortunately, we still have a little ways to go. Like it is going in the right direction, but it's not completely sorted yet because the Fed's target rate is 2% and it's still at 3.4%. So it's still too high versus what they want. And furthermore, core inflation, which removes the uh, removes categories like food and energy as they are both typically very bouncy and they can sway that headline inflation um, rate a, quite a bit from month to month. Uh, that number currently sits a little bit higher than the headline rate at 3.9%. So inflation yeah. is still there, not as bad, but it's still there. So we're in an interesting kind of time. Yeah. But overall, that's kind of the backdrop. Um, yeah. Hamish, did you then want to take us from the backdrop to kind of what investors should expect this year? Yeah, yeah. I was just going to add one other thing just on core inflation and, and just the, the last bit of inflation. Yeah. It tends to be that last couple of percent that's the most difficult to get down. And the reason is because after you've been in kind of in this inflationary environment for a couple of years, uh, the expectations for inflation start to get what the well, the finance fancy finance term is entrenched. Um, so people start to expect that prices are going to continue to rise and therefore they act accordingly. They, they, they tend to want to get ahead of inflation. You know, if that fridge you're going to buy is going to be four or 5% more expensive in a year's time, you should buy it now. And the act of doing that can actually make that last bit of inflation um, kind of difficult to to get down. Uh, and the other kind of element of it is a large part of that last bit of inflation is services inflation, which is notoriously very difficult to get down because there's a huge human element involved in those services. So um, it's, you know, you when you have, you know, wage growth that's supported by inflation, then it's 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 very difficult for for that last bit of inflation to, to go down. So that's why, you know, we, we saw a very quick decline to some extent, you know, reasonably quick decline from like nine to three, four percent. And then if you look at like the last four or five months, it's kind of just bounced around in that range. Um, so to, that's, that, as you said, that's kind of the backdrop of like, you know, what we're going into is like, can we, can we get that last bit of inflation down? So then, yeah, we can talk about, you know, I guess some of the different themes, yeah, going into, into this year. Um, I think you've got a couple of themes here and I've got a couple here um, as well. Of course, one of the, probably, especially if you're looking at the US, one of the most interesting themes is the US presidential election. Uh, that of course happens uh, once every four years. That'll be taking place, um, I think, in November of, uh, of of this year. I think is when they typically hold the the uh, the federal uh, election. And we can kind of uh, look at some interesting stats, I guess, around 
how the economy and the stock market interacts with uh, 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 with the election, um, you know, in both directions. What does the election impact on the markets and how does the markets impact the election? Um, so historically, uh, in an in the election year, um, stock market performance has actually historically been more positive than negative. Um, the average return uh, has been 11.3%. Uh, when a Republican was elected, it was uh, an average of 15.3%. And when a Democrat was elected, it was an average of uh, 7.6%. Um, Interesting. But if you actually look at year by year, you know, those averages sound kind of nice and rosy, but uh, if you look at a year by year, there's a huge amount of variance and it, it, it's basically random. Um, so it doesn't look like there's any real correlation to, to, to any extent, um, between the election year, or I guess like the year before the election, cause it happens at the end of the year, um, and investment returns. But there is, um, some element of correlation between the economy and election results. Um, and, uh, there was a report by Goldman Sachs that was put out recently that kind of explored both of those elements from, you know, the election affecting the economy and the economy affecting the election. Um, so how does the economy affect the election? Uh, first term incumbents. Um, so Biden, for example, it's his first term and he's running for, well, he's probably going to run for re-election. They tend to have an advantage in elections. So um, they, they tend to win more often than they, they don't. But there is an exception and the exception is in recession years. So in recession years, um, the, the challenger, um, which in this case would be the Republican party, probably Trump, um, actually wins more often than not. Uh, and, and that kind of makes logical sense. I think, uh, if, because if there is poor economic circumstances, people are more likely to seek a change in government. Um, so that kind of, you know, seems to make pretty rational sense. Uh, and then you can think of how does the election affect the economy? Um, so Goldman Sachs found that whoever wins uh, in 2024 uh, will usually face uh, a very, uh, so, well, so, sorry, this is just the kind of the start of the thing. Um, whoever wins this year uh, will face a, an unusually large budget deficit. Um, so in 2023, it was 1.7 trillion. Um, in the last 60 years, on average, fiscal policy grows more expansive ahead of elections. So the government tends to ramp up spending going into the election, which again kind of makes logical sense. Uh, in twenty in financial year twenty twenty four so far, the budget deficit has been five hundred and ten billion dollars. So that's since October first. So in three and a half months, five hundred and ten billion dollars. Um, and then after the election, uh, winning incumbents, which would be uh, Biden or, or Democrats in this case, tend to tighten policy somewhat following the results. Um, so that's okay. kind of the general, you know, if you're looking broadly at how the economy interacts with, with elections. Mm. And that shows a very important point, Hamish. I'm going to take us through to a different theme, um, is that these large deficits, so the US now runs very consistently a big deficit. They spend more than they earn, which means they have to go into a lot of debt. They have to keep taking on more debt. Um, just to fund their spending sprees. Yeah. Um, so that also means that the government, when they refinance their debt, are facing higher interest rates. And that brings us back to the topic of interest rates because this year, um, you know, we're feeling higher mortgage costs. Businesses aren't quite able to expand. The government has a big pile of debt. Everybody kind of it's nice. It feels good when interest rates go down. Um, however, there's a lot of debate, and this will continue throughout 2024, as to what will happen with interest rates in 2024. So in the US, um, the Federal Reserve are currently saying that they expect uh, three interest rate cuts in 2024, each being, what, 0.25%. So they're ex they're expecting rates to come down a little bit, but not that much. And that you know, high interest rates do tend to weigh on the stock market. We have seen the stock market rise already on the expectation that rates will be cut. But it's also worth mentioning that this is very hotly debated at the moment yeah. as to whether interest rates will come down or whether they will stay around what they are. Yeah. And there are a lot of there are a lot of people. Uh, a lot of economists even that do believe, I mean, Jamie Dimon, CEO of JP Morgan is saying, look here, I don't think rates are coming down. And the reason is partially because of inflation. So at the moment, um, 
there's a lot of concern in America around taking their foot off the gas or, or you know, um, just lowering interest rates at a time where inflation is not 100% back down to where they would like it to be. And the reason that everyone's a bit jittery around that idea is because of the 1970s. So in America in the 1970s, there were three waves, consecutive waves of inflation, each higher than the last. And this all came about because as inflation started to cool each time, the Fed then loosened its grip and it lowered interest rates back down. But the premature easing of the monetary policy just loosened loosen the slack on a dog's leash. And what happens yeah. when you loosen the slack on a dog's leash? It just pulls harder again. Maybe to add a bit of context to that as well. Uh, in the last, uh, the, the last time that, you know, inf- the, the second time inflation peaked and then started to come down and they decided to lower interest rates, inflation was around 5%. So our inflation is a little bit lower. But yeah, if you, if I was, I was talk- uh, funnily enough, if you kind of measure uh, inflation the same way that it was measured back then, our inflation is still higher than it was back then. So it would be a pretty right. similar, you, you could argue that potentially it's a similar circumstance where if, if they start to lower rates now, it could also be, you know, premature in the same way that it was, you know, in the seventies. Yeah. Um, so right now, as we sit here in 2024, the Federal Reserve is acutely aware of how bad the management was in the 1970s, and they really want to ensure that it doesn't happen again. So that's the first factor why they might be hesitant to lower interest rates. There's another couple of factors that uh, are also very inflationary that we're still seeing play out as we speak. So the first one is the ongoing war in Ukraine. Um, this war impacts uh, grain supply around the world as Ukraine's a big exporter. It also impacts, as we have seen, everybody has seen, it impacts energy prices. Um, Ukraine is a significant transit route for natural gas and oil pipelines that transport Russian energy resources to Europe. And any disruption in energy supply chain, uh, in the energy supply chain due to the conflict can lead and has led to higher energy prices. So that's still ongoing. That still causes problems. Um, and that those problems are inflationary. Uh, And then if one conflict wasn't enough, we also have the Houthi rebels attacking cargo ships in the Red Sea, which is uh, disrupting the major shipping lane between Europe to Asia. Uh, Now, we've spoken about this a couple of times, so we don't have to harp on about it too much. Um, But pretty much um, they are blockading, they they are stopping ships or they are attacking ships going through the Suez Canal and the Red Sea, which is the major shipping lane. So that means that a lot of these major shipping companies are rerouting their ships around the bottom of Africa. So what this has done is it's already skyrocketed ocean um, freight costs, which is now leading to skyrocketing uh, air freight costs. And it's also delaying shipments of goods uh, as the cargo ships have to take the longer route. So it increases their transit time. So Overall, we've got a few things like a lot of people are very excited for interest rates to come down and rightly so because high interest rates suck. However, <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to understand that there are still some inflationary factors out there in the world, some big ones. And there's also the fact that the Fed really doesn't want a repeat of the 1970s. So with that said, while I think it's worthwhile expecting that it could go either way this year when it comes to interest rates. Interest rates could come down, fingers crossed it all goes well, but it also might not happen. The Fed yeah. is probably hesitant to lower interest rates. So that would be the second big theme to look at uh, in 2024. Yeah, I put this just as a note, just as kind of a bottom line or like a summary of like all of these things that we're talking about. These are all kind of just interesting economic and financial factors to be aware of. Um, You know, this isn't, you know, even if the economy looked terrible, it wouldn't be an indication probably that you should change your investing strategy in in any way or that you should try and time the market or that a market crash is coming or anything like that. These are just things to be aware of, to understand, to hopefully, you know, have have a bit of a better understanding of, of, you know, have some context, have some context to the environment that, um, that we're operating in. Another big theme uh, will very likely continue, was started in 2023 and will continue this year is AI and the Magnificent Seven. Um, so, you know, especially if you're, say, if you're a passive investor and you invest into an, an S&P 500 index, for example, uh, the the total value of the S&P 500 or the, the, the market cap of all the companies is about $40 trillion. Uh, the Magnificent Seven alone is $12 trillion. 
which is about a third wow. of the index. So um, That's uh, huge. essentially, <laughs> uh, even though, the, you know, obviously the Magnificent Seven was a massive story in, in 2023, how they perform this year is going to continue to impact the overall performance of the index in, in a meaningful way. Uh, just another interesting kind of separation of the Magnificent Seven and the rest of the market. Uh, analysts are currently expecting the S&P 500 companies to uh, see earnings growth of about 11 to 12%. Uh, but if you separate Magnificent Seven, they're expected to grow by over 20%. And then if you look at the rest of the market, so the S&P excluding the Magnificent Seven, they're only expected to grow earnings by 6.7%. So it really shows you that where the, the, the index is really two markets. Like you've got to kind of think mm. of it, um, uh, you've got to kind of think of it as two categories. You've got these seven companies that are doing, you know, getting exposed to this AI story. And then, you know, the rest of the market, which is more of a reflection, I think, of the rest of the economy. Yeah. And just to build off that point as well, the only other thing I wanted to talk about when it comes to AI and the Magnificent Seven. So the Magnificent Seven are kind of the big seven technology stocks that are also kind of integrating a lot of AI into their products. And that's why there's so much hype around them. But the only other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, an article or someone uh, might have even been, it was Steve Eisman, that's who it was, talking about um, the earnings of these uh, tech companies. And he noted that while AI is going to be a big driver of share market returns over the long run, um, it's still very early. And when we're talking about specifically 2024, these big companies are still trying very hard to integrate AI into their products, but it's unlikely that that will lead to any significant increases in revenues for these companies this year. I mean, yeah. 2024 is set to be still more of like a testing bed for AI. Yeah. Um, there is one company in the Magnificent Seven that is already seeing their earnings skyrocket. And it's very interesting. That company is NVIDIA. And the reason they are seeing massive impact on their earnings is because they are on the hardware side. Yeah. So all of these companies are buying hardware off of NVIDIA, which has to happen up front so that all these companies can then go and do their testing and, and create their own products based on this new technology. So it's interesting. NVIDIA is seeing all of the clients buy hardware off of them. However, the the other technology companies are still probably in full experiment mode in 2024. And it's probably unlikely that we'll see a massive game-changing product. I mean, you can even think about ChatGPT that came out at the end of 2022. That's still so early in its revenue generation. Of course. Yep. It's, and that's that was the first thing. That was the thing that the trigger, the catalyst for this whole trend. Yeah. And, and that it, one's still very early. So, yeah. Yeah. And Eisman also spoke about how we haven't really seen any actual AI companies emerge. We've kind of really only seen big tech companies adopting AI. Uh, so it will be interesting mm. to see over ne this year and, and you know, over, over the following years, as we start to see actual AI companies emerge in the same way that, you know, in the early 2000s, you know, 10, 10 plus years after the internet was, was mainstream, it was then that we started to see uh, the development of pure kind of uh, internet companies like like the you know youtube didn't come out until 2005 for example um you know ne ne netflix didn't go stream didn't have a streaming product until 2007 now this is 10 15 years after uh after the internet was already going mainstream um so we likely haven't even seen a, a lot of the big ai companies or the companies we will know as uh, ai companies they probably don't even exist yet and we'll, we'll start to see those come out maybe this year but certainly over the next few years. Yeah. So overall, that is the backdrop. That's where we were, how we've gotten to the point we're in now, and also some context around what to expect uh, this year. And then in the last section of this podcast, I just wanted to talk about investing during this time. That's obviously yeah. what people are tuned into us for. Um, and let's break it down into passive investors and active investors. So I think the easy one to take first straight off the bat is passive investors. Um, that, from my my opinion on that, is that your investing strategy never ever changes. It doesn't matter if yeah. the market's up, down, sideways, backwards, yeah. inverted, inside yeah. out, whatever. <laughs> you just keep going. You just keep doing the same thing because that strategy is saying, "I don't know enough to pick the winners. I don't know enough to pick the winning times." So my my stupid head is just going to <laughs> try and benefit from the share market overall over a long period of time by 
diversifying my money across the whole market through something like a market tracking ETF. And then I'm just going to put a little bit more money into that ETF over time. And as the stock market bounces around, that will buy me more shares and eventually I'll even out to the overall yep. share market return. Yep. And that is historically, historically, it's a strong strategy. Um, yep. And usually it beats people trying to pick stocks. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Not only has so, it been very good, it's, it's, you know, most people, most retail investors who pick stocks lose money and even most fund managers aren't able to, to, to beat the index after you take into account their fees. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a historically been a very, very good strategy. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know how you feel, but for me as, cause I'm in part a passive investor, I, subscribe to both active and passive. Yeah. But for me as a passive investor this year, how am I going to change my investing? I'm not at all. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any other thoughts on that? No, that's, that's, that's basically it. And even when it comes to, you know, active investing, you shouldn't really be changing your principles based on, generally speaking, you shouldn't be changing your principles based on what's happening in the economy. You should have kind of a set of principles that you use to pick individual companies. And that should um, you know, that, that should remain the case regardless of what's happening. So even though you might change what you're investing in, if you're being a little bit more active, um, the principles that you're applying should kind of remain fairly consistent. And one pretty reasonable way to go about it, uh, if, if you think that you can't predict the economy, which, uh, nobody can, so <laughs> that would be the correct opinion is to pick kind of all weather companies, um, companies that can weather any storm. And so you don't have to worry, right? If you're holding a company and the economy goes into a recession, you know that they're probably going to be okay. Um, and th these companies have, you know, a bunch of characteristics. They have low debt. They have uh, a, maybe a strong economic moat. So something that kind of compels customers to come back to this specific business and not change to another business when they're getting price sensitive, for example. Uh, they have an excellent management team that, you know, maybe has a history of navigating difficult economic circumstances and adjusting the business accordingly. Um, you know, businesses that are consistently profitable is pretty important. Uh, I, I like to look back over 10, 15 years and see, did these companies lose money in the last recession? Because that can, you know, bring a bit of, you know, worry from an investor perspective. If a company is suddenly burning cash, can they survive? Um, mm. And another interesting one is, are they going to be or likely affected by big technology shifts like AI, for example? There's a really uh, famous Warren Buffett quote about, uh, he says something about the economy, but it won't change the way that people chew gum, uh, right? So there's some businesses where regardless of what's going on in the economy or regardless of shifts in technology, um, it doesn't really change the business. Uh, the business is just kind of a, 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 it's very consistent over multiple decades of, you know, the internet popping up, AI popping up and computers and, and all sorts of things. So that's another thing you can think mm. about, like how exposed is the business to being disrupted by the latest technology? Um, mm. Yeah. Yeah. I think very similarly, I just think back to, um, so as an active investor in 2024, we spoke about this in our last podcast, Hamish, you spoke about um, how defaults um, had a corporate debt, like in that corporate debt story, how co more companies are going bankrupt. And you said, why? Yeah. <laughs> and the trend was negative cash flow, high debt burdens, and weak liquidity. So I think yeah. that's specifically what you're looking for is the opposite. When we're yeah. looking for companies to invest in, when all this, all, there's all this macro uncertainty and high interest rates, you're looking for positive cash flow, low debt burdens, and strong liquidity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think if you can tick those off, yeah, if you can tick those off, like I agree with you, Hamish, that definitely your 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 system doesn't change when it comes to analyzing the companies. But I think when you get into a period like we're in right now where interest rates are climbing, those are, you know, three things that you can particularly look at just to play it safe. Yeah. And then, you know, if there is short-term pain, we never know that if there's going to be a recession or, 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 or you know, whatever's going on in the economy. Um, it's always, you know, it, just an opportunity to potentially buy good businesses at better prices from people who are selling good businesses out of fear, which does definitely mm -hmm. happen. If you look through history, whenever there's broad economic problems, even good businesses, their stocks go down which doesn't really make any sense. If you're planning on holding a good business for 10 years and they're always profitable, they have low debt, they've got great growth opportunities in front of them, 
what does one bad year mean? But the stock will still probably go down because people sell out of fear. They want to move into cash. They want to move into bonds. They want to go into something fixed and a bit more tangible. Uh, like gold, you generally see people flood to gold, but that's a really good opportunity to get in on some of these good businesses at prices that you just wouldn't see when things are all rosy. Um, and that's kind of your yep. mindset if you're an active investor is to is yep. to, to to buy from people selling out of fear. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that if you go into your brokerage site and you buy some shares right now, there's an 80%, roughly an 80% chance that the shares that you just bought have come from an institutional money manager, a, a big, what we call the big money, you know? Yeah. Um, There's only a, roughly a 20% chance that you've actually bought it from an individual like like you or me. Yeah. So, and the reason that that happens and the the reason Hamish is talking about these these periods of fear and, you know, even good companies, their stock, their stock prices can fall down. You say, how can that happen? You know, surely people understand that these are good companies. There are people out there with way better analytical skills than me in this realm. And, you know, this is a good business and still the stock is falling. It is out of fear. And it's also out of the fact that the institutional money are quite simply playing a different game to what we are in the stock market. That's the simple reality. They are playing a short-term game of impressing their clients and their bosses from quarter to quarter, trying not to lose their jobs. So they have to act. When stuff happens, they have to do something. They don't want to be the fund left holding the bag. That's what Hamish always says to me. Don't want to be the fund holding the bag. Yep. So they have to do these things short-term. Um, and that causes, because they are 80% of the market, that causes enough buying pressure, selling pressure to really move stock prices, even when in 10 years, this company might be you know, obviously the best thing since sliced bread. And that's yep. what gives us, the small guys, the opportunities to be nimble, dance in and out. When the stock crashes, buy up shares, and hold them for the long term and benefit. That's yeah. how we get um, opportunities in the market. Yeah. And hopefully that's been a, a good investor economic overview of, uh, of uh, you know, what's been happening in the markets and maybe what to expect and, and, and some of the ways you can think about your own investment portfolio as we, uh, I keep saying as we enter 2024, but we're already in it uh, as we progress mm. through uh, through 2024. So hopefully you guys enjoyed this uh, episode. And as always, we encourage uh, your, your feedback, um, which you can leave on the YouTube uh, version of the podcast. Or if you're in Spotify, you can just leave your feedback in kind of the question section. Um, you can leave questions or if you have feedback yeah. as well, uh, we welcome that. Uh, thanks, Brandon, Love for joining it. me as always. And we will be All back good, next week. So have a great uh, rest of your week and uh, we'll see you guys later. See you guys. See ya.